from an undisclosed location, from a secret hunting spot known only to him and the guy who told him about it, and possibly the guy who told the guy who told him. It's the show all about hunting in New Zealand and around the globe. This is The Hunting Show. Now here's your host, Stephen Spargo. Getting children into the outdoors is something that all of us are passionate about, and if we're not, we should be, because this is the future of our sport, getting young people involved. The interesting thing is a lot of people are coming up with the conclusion that getting children into the outdoors makes them more rounded and better individuals, and I certainly wouldn't disagree. As a scout leader, I use the outdoors as a mechanic or a tool for teaching young people about nature, but also I think it teaches them a lot about themselves. I found a couple of articles online, but this set of ideas that I found on the Queens of Camo page, it's a, or Queens of Camo website, was one that sort of rung true with me. Now, we're actually interviewing the founder of Queens of Camo in a couple of weeks' time. These are the points that they make, and I'm not sure where they got these facts from, or if they're facts or only opinions, but I'm going to plagiarise them and pretend they're my opinions anyway. The first one is children in outdoor education settings show an improvement in self-esteem, problem-solving, and motivation. I tend to agree with that. I think that outdoor settings definitely help children with self-esteem, particularly if they're working in groups. Now, in scouting, I've dealt with a number of young people who are homeschooled, which is homeschooled, sorry. And that's great, except sometimes socially they're a little bit awkward. They haven't been in that uh, playground setting where pecking order becomes important. And uh, I think getting them in the outdoors means they get to do that in quite a safe environment. I also think that being outdoors forces motivation. You have to do something, otherwise you won't eat, you won't be warm, and you won't have shelter. So maybe just because of what it is, it actually forces young people to have motivation. Children in schoolyards with both green areas and human-made play areas engage in more creative forms of play and play more cooperatively. I think that makes complete sense and a little bit harps back to what we were talking about before. Outdoor experiences help reduce negative stress and protect our psychological well-being. Absolutely. frickin lootly I completely agree. I certainly come back from some sort of outdoor experience, typically hunting, or sometimes it's just going camping with my family or my wife. I come back far more relaxed. Have you noticed the same thing? If you live a high-stress life or a high-pressure job, or have a high-pressure job, do you find after you come back you're more able to deal with the stress and the pressure of your workplace? This next one I've thought about quite a bit. Increased studies of nature and science, especially in the very young, has proven in studies to be extremely beneficial for cognitive functioning, reduced symptoms of attention deficit disorder, and increased self-discipline and emotional well-being. I personally think that a better understanding of the world around us gives us a better sense of who we are. And that would make sense. Also, being out in nature forces you to understand what's going on. And for children with things that are in the spectrum disorder or acoustic spectrum disorders, I think being in nature gives them a sense of calming down, and this is my own opinion, I don't have any science in front of me to back this up, but I also think that it, it forces them to understand the world around them. Children who spend time outdoors develop a love and a sense of respect for their environment. Absolutely. I don't think uh, we need to go into that too much. Children who spend time outdoors have a lower risk from mental health issues and several physical conditions. And again, just being active can eliminate all kinds of physical conditions. And I personally think that anything that may help with mental health issues is a bonus for our young people. Get them away from computers, get them away from screens, get them away from all of this hyper-stimulation that's in front of them. Maybe not all of the time, and it's important for children to understand computers before I start getting emails about that. But we all want to get our kids out and with nature. And in New Zealand particularly, we're very lucky to have nature at our doorsteps. Gee, where I live, I can take uh, young people for a walk in the forest, or I can take um, myself or my wife, we can go for a walk uh, that, that's, that's beautiful, it's right in nature, we can't hear cars, and it's literally five minutes from our home. And most people outside of the big cities, and even some of the ones in the big cities, certainly in suburbs, are going to find they can get that little taste of nature without going too far. So please, let me know, how do you get your young people out into the bush? How do you get, convince your children that it's time to go hunting? Or is it, they, is it something they look forward to? I've found that personally. If you, if you say that's what's going to happen and you follow through with that and you take your young person out, that's something they're always going to look forward to and I think they're going to cherish for the rest of their lives. And hopefully, just hopefully, it makes them more rounded individuals going forward.
Our interview today is coming to you all the way from the United States, and unfortunately his Skype line is a little bit bad. Joined by Skype with award-winning hunter and photographer Joseph Byers. How are you, Joseph? I'm fantastic. Look, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, well, I uh, was born uh, near Washington, D.C. in the USA, uh, in the rural part of, of Maryland. Um, and I said I grew up in a hunting family, uh, uh, enjoyed it immensely. I'm an educator by trade, uh, became a school principal, and uh, began to just write about some of my hunting adventures, and that became fairly successful. And so I've been doing it, doing it now for almost 30 years. Something you mentioned to me in our email correspondence is you've got a New Zealand connection. I do, yes. Uh, actually, my wife's father, mm -hmm. um, uh, name, his name was Wally, uh, came from New Zealand. Uh, my, my wife's mother was a uh, an Italian, and Wally was, during World War II, he deserted uh, to run away with her and uh, eventually got <laughs> Guys, back in the graces of the of the army again without being shot because that's what they do with deserters. But anyway, uh, my my uh, my wife was born and never really knew who her father was until uh, we eventually put the pieces together and we flew to New Zealand uh, 18 years ago and uh, they got to meet. Have you done any hunting in New Zealand? I, I have. I've hunted a couple of times. I actually hunted with. Uh, uh, with Wally on the the North Island, yeah, and then I've hunted twice on the South Island. Um, uh, once once again on that 18 years ago, um, I shot a red stag, and uh, this last time uh, we, we did a, uh, um, a a bigger red stag this time, and um, um, uh, a tar, a Himalayan tar, which was I very much enjoyed that. Yeah, the the South Island's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is fantastic, yes. Now, you've also done quite a bit of bow hunting in Africa, and this is the bit I found fascinating looking through your website. You've, ha you know, for me, that's so far, and I haven't done that, and I think a lot of young New Zealand hunters or hunters in general that live here aspire to do some of the things you've done. Um, how did you get into that? Well, I, I met someone. Uh, we have an archery trade show here in the United States called the ATA Show, and uh, I attended one about 20 See, 21 years ago, or 22, and they had a bomb scare, and uh, so we all had to get out of the convention hall and go to a to a hotel nearby. And we were just sitting around, and happened to be uh, sitting next to Neil Summers. And Neil Summers uh, has a bow hunting booking uh, agency, um, and uh, he was telling me about Africa, and he knew that I did a lot of writing. And he said, you know, I people, I know people that would be interested in having you come and write about what they do. And I said. Okay, I think I could do that. So um, I'm actually going to be leaving here in, in the next 10 days for my 21st safari. 21 safaris, all in Africa? All in Africa, Oh, yes. you, you legend. I'm, I'm sincerely jealous. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you've, okay, so you've hunted uh, all over the world. Is it vastly different? Are the techniques you use different in New Zealand to Africa to the USA? Um, yes and no. It, it kind of depends. Um uh, in, uh, for example, the red stag hunt um, was a basic spot and stalk. Uh, we tried it with uh, uh, with a bow and arrow. You, you may remember this. Uh, this was about six or seven years ago. There was an enormous uh, snowstorm that happened in your October mm. uh, because there was literally three feet of snow in one night. It was a disaster. <laughs> they had to fly us out in helicopters to get us to the airport. Um, but um, uh, the spot and stalk techniques are, are very similar uh, to uh, to our Western game animals. Mm. Um, I'm just thinking of I've hunted elk in the Rocky Mountains and Wyoming and Montana, and uh, you know that's that, that's not not very different. Uh, in, in Africa, uh, the bow hunting is primarily done around water holes. You actually do ambushes, and uh, the place I'm going to is called Agia, A G A G I A, and uh, they have. Uh, blinds that are they're about 10 feet square. They're actually built into the ground so that when you shoot, your arrow is only about an, um, a foot off the ground. Um, so it, they're uh, you know they're good about containing scent and very good about hiding movement so that right. you know you can really take your time and get make a good shot. You've um, you alluded to one thing that or 
well, basically, you brought me up with, well, brought my mind to attention with one thing, and that was actually one thing when I've gone hunting with Americans here, they can't believe that our hunting season is all year round, all the time, any time, and it's always, it's always good hunting. Yes, yes, it is, and that's very, very unlike it is here. Although our archery seasons um, run usually a month to five or six months, uh, but. Um, Yes, and it's, it's, it's quite different. Africa's a lot like that as well. It more depends on the rainy seasons there, right. depending what part of Africa. Uh, the, the countries that I've hunted in the most are Namibia and South Africa. So there you have a distinct dry season and a distinct rainy season um, in, the, in your winter months. Have, you've done a lot of bow hunting, clearly, and you've, I've also seen that you use firearms as well. Would you prefer one over the other, or is it just whatever situation warrants whatever weapon? You know, I just wrote an article. Uh, it was called uh, Great Plains Triple Play, and it's basically I killed a white-tailed deer uh, last year with a, one with a crossbow, one with a rifle, and one with a muzzleloader. Right. And uh, it's it's really about, I think, more how the plan comes together. You know, if I was going to do a high mountain hunt, let's say for tar, and, uh, you know, I did some research and knew that there were animals in a certain area— maybe even spent the night on the mountain, you know, in a tent and was able to get the, and, you know, get the big, the big bull that I was, I was after, you know, that, that would be, you know, that's about as good as it gets. And, yeah. and my conclusion in this last uh, article that I wrote was I actually was using a crossbow for the first time. And uh, I got to hunt a place in a, in a manner that I had always wanted to do. It was kind of in the back of my mind, you know, if I could get down in this draw, down in this thick bush, I bet I could shoot a big buck in there. Uh, and and it worked out exactly as I planned. And so whenever a plan comes together, it's like the old A team. <laughs> you know, you love it when a plan comes together. It just makes it more gratifying. Because bow hunting in New Zealand is an emerging sport. Uh, we've actually done a couple of shows, or one particular show, about bow hunting. And very, very small community, very, very close-knit. Do you think New Zealand is, is a great venue for overseas bow hunters or a great destination for overseas bow hunters to try? Oh, Absolutely. Um, I, uh, often when I go hunting, um, I have a sponsor, uh, or a series of sponsors. And so I tend to use to hunt with whomever is, um, you know, paying the bill. And, um, uh, I'm just thinking I had a, a, a black powder, the, the, um, see the red stag I took the last time was with a, a night muzzleloader. That's when night muzzle, muzzleloading, uh, night rifles were in business. And, uh, so, I mean, you know, that was exciting. It, if, if we needed to do it with a bow, we could have. As I'm saying, we, we got hit by this, this tremendous storm um, <laughs> that <laughs> it, it, it knocked the lights out. I mean, it was, it was a disaster for the locals. The, the trees were down because the leaves are still on the trees. Um, and, uh, again, it was a solid three feet of snow. It was up to, up to your crotch <laughs> when you tried to walk in. <laughs> so that, that would have been tough to bow hunt in. But, uh, no, I you know, you can you – can, you can take almost any situation and and make it suitable for bow hunting. You just you have to approach it in a different way. If you're a bow hunter, your number one is you have to be close. Mm. And so, but an, animals that you know that that you have to study their movements. You know where they go. Do they go through a small ravine or through a patch of trees or uh, up over a ridge? You know, can you build a blind? Can you get in a tree? Use a, what we call tree stands here in the states. Um, you know, those are all good tactics. And uh, sometimes you can use bait or water. In, in Africa, primarily they use water because it's scarce uh, in the dry season. And uh, animals come to drink, so you see a lot of them and uh, usually get a close shot. Talking about tree stands just for a moment, it's something that we don't really use here. Guys are starting to build them, uh, but I don't think it's kind of the done thing in New Zealand. I know a couple of guys that have built them, and their mates give them a bit of grief saying that's not real hunting. I think it's a much more common practice around the world, isn't it? In, in the United States, it's uh, almost every whitetail hunter uh, uses a tree stand. Now, depending how old you are, uh, we have we have what are called ladder stands now, which have helped guys my age. <laughs> I, I'm a I'm, I'm a senior certified senior citizen, so I I don't like shinning up trees on the, in tiny little uh, platforms to stand on and so forth. I like the ladder stands where you can use both both hands and climb up and have a seat to sit in and so forth. But it's it's really very exhilarating. It gives you a bird's eye view. I mean, literally uh, of everything that happens, and especially in a wooded area where game can walk underneath. Uh, you could have red deer or you know the the local uh, 
uh, fauna just walk around right under your stand and they don't know you're there unless they smell you and you just have to be careful of the wind. I've even seen some of the blinds that you've got over there and the mirror. You know, I've I've seen that. I've never actually used that technique. I've not. I've even seen stalking apparatus like that, where you place a mirror and the animal can only see its reflection. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. That's uh, it would take a pretty unique place for that. I'm guessing those would be quite heavy. Number one, <laughs> uh, most of the the pop up blinds that we have are hub blinds. You know, weigh ten to twenty pounds, and you can you know, carry it over your shoulder. Some of them are the real small ones. You just literally throw them up in the air and they they deploy and you can, you can crawl in and they're ideal, especially with a crossbow um, yep. or a rifle if you have a small, a small secluded area. One of the big perceptions Kiwis have before they hunt in the United States is hunting there is far easier than it is here. Uh, they look at the clothing that New Zealanders have to wear. They're generally bush bashing and pushing through things where Americans are all about lightweight and new technology. Would you, having done both, would you agree with that? Well, I, I would. I will admit whatever. I'm, I'm not sure that what the term for your your bush is there, but it is nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that we don't we don't have anything quite like well we I guess we do we have we have uh, briars green briars and multiflora rose and we have some pretty nasty stuff too but usually that's not you don't you hunt in that or you hunt around it you don't have to go through it like you do in um, in Kiwi land uh, but um, uh, let's see it's it's the United States is so big and there's such a diverse terrain mm. uh, it's really hard to make any generalizations. Um, uh, you may see more game. For example, if you want to compare a red stag hunt to an elk hunt um, in the in the uh, western states, um, you know any of your your residents could could fly here and uh, you know buy a license over the counter. For example, in Colorado uh, during the second rifle season and actually go hunting. Now you'd be hunting on public land. You would be uh, you're going to be hunting from six to ten thousand feet. And uh, there could be, there will be a lot of pressure, typically right. hunting pressure. Typically, the further you walk, the fewer hunters you see. Yeah, and then you have to him. get the animal out. That's the big thing. Uh, you know, a six to 800 pound elk is not an easy transport. I think one of the other things, or one of the perceptions that I personally have is where I live, I live in the central North Island. And for example, I remember one night a couple of weeks ago, I left my, my workplace at four o'clock in the afternoon. I was home hanging animal in my garage, much to my wife's disgust, at 8 o'clock that night. And I had a bear out with a friend at this, uh, amongst that as well. I think hunting here is far more accessible. Is it? Would that be right? Um, actually, it's not. Um, the, the reason I got, um, especially uh, with white-tailed deer, our white-tailed deer are very, very, very prolific. Right. And lots of fellows do exactly what you do. They come home from work at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, our seasons open in uh, in early September when it doesn't get dark until eight, right. and so uh, you know they come home and and go hunting two or three hours after work, uh, you know any you know for quite a period of time, or they take a half day off, or go hunting in the morning even. It's, mm. The sun comes up early enough that you can actually uh, hunt in the morning, which I've done many times, you know, before going to work. That's interesting. No, I, I do think Kiwis have this bizarre impression of what goes on in the United States, the ones that haven't been there particularly, and a lot of Kiwi hunters do manage to get over there. Do you think Kiwi hunters are skilled? They are schooled. You mean skillful as skilled. hunters? Yeah, skillful as, hunt as hunters, yeah. You know, I, I would have really no way, I would have no way to, to gauge that. Um, uh, you know, if if you want to be learn to hunt something today with the internet, you can, you know, you yeah. can go to websites. Um, you know, if you're not on uh, griffinsguide.com, I would hope you would uh, uh, tune in there. You'll see a lot of my posts and so forth. Uh, we try and keep the uh, the American public or the world public actually involved in hunting every day. So you'll see a new post almost every day about some aspect of hunting. Uh, but uh, the American TV shows and, and, and videos are, are a good way to get a, a glimpse of, mm -hmm. of hunting, again, it's you know anything that's on video isn't totally real, but it's it's pretty close, and uh, would give you an idea of what the animals are like, where they're located, uh, the kinds of the ways that they're hunted, you know that kind of thing. Now, one thing I found fascinating is you've hunted with a number of celebrities. Yes, I have. Now, the, from what you said there, just like us, they like the outdoors, they love going hunting, and they like 
uh, the, for the hunting fraternity. I don't know if that's the word you used, but they, they like the, the fact that you go out there and you get to know people on, on a different level. Can you tell us yes. about some of the best celebrities you've taken hunting? Well, let me just think. Dave Watson is a good example. Dave uh, still has a show, I think, with uh, Matthews bow hunting. Mm -hmm. um, Dave and I hunted in, um, uh, in Newfoundland. Uh, it was a, a difficult hunt. Actually, it was kind of a public land hunt. But usually when uh, you get invited to go to a place like that, they have, uh, you know, private property or whatever. But, you know, we were hunting among other hunters and so forth, and uh, we were able to get two nice caribou. Uh, Newfoundland is a really difficult place to, to hunt. Uh, the, 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 uh, the landscape is it's one step up and one step down. You know, <laughs> a ball gets just... There's no such thing as solid ground, it seems. So <laughs> that, was, that was really a challenge. Um, I'm just thinking, I, I, uh, I fished with Larry Zonka, uh, who was a well-known football player. Um, I took uh, Trace Adkins uh, shooting one time. Now, Trace had the, uh, he, as he told me, he said uh, his first wife shot him in the heart. and didn't kill him. But he said he, he left town before his second wife could get a shot at him. Um, and I took Trace uh, Clay. Uh, uh, sporting clay hunting, uh, which is uh, you know shooting clays in uh, in various from various positions and so forth. Mm. And yeah. uh, he had a lot he, he had a lot of fun with that. He's uh, he's still pretty well known. And would you say wh who was your number one? Who was the best hunter out of all the celebrities you've taken? Oh, um, let me just think. Yeah, I can Put tell you, you who spot. that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, I don't I don't mind I don't mind saying. Um, uh, I'm just I'm trying to think. He's actually a country and western singer now. One one of the things that my my age I can still shoot well, but my memory sucks. Okay, <laughs> just have senior moments all the time. I'll think of his name, but he was a ranger. Yep. At the time we went hunting, um, an army ranger, which uh, kind of like a green beret, or I'm, I'm not sure your special forces of a you know have similar types of training. But we went caribou hunting, and he actually put the entire caribou. I mean we. We dressed it and uh, and caped out the head and horns and it was absolutely amazing. And um, you know he was uh, because because his military training he was a very skillful outdoorsman. I actually go hunting occasionally with a guy who's ex army, and the thing that amazes me is the amount of weight these men can take with them. Yes, beats me hands yes. down. Now, yeah, it's. Yeah. You you uh, you have to marvel. You know, if we have a, a twenty pound pack or a twenty five pound pack, we get uh, we get concerned. And the average soldier now carries at least fifty pounds of gear, uh, and, and maybe maybe twice that. <laughs> yeah. Now, Joseph, you've got a book. Uh, it's an ebook, I mean, uh, from what I can read. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that book and where we can get it? Okay. Well, it's it's at Amazon.com. It's called uh, um, C Celebrities in the Outdoors. And uh, it um, it came from uh, um, an assignment I had once. I, I was the hunting editor for a magazine called Heartland USA. And Heartland USA, their niche was they liked to take celebrities hunting um, or fishing and and not talk about their sport or their, their genre. Uh, for example, Carl Malone was a famous basketball player here in the USA uh, a number of years ago, and and. Uh, uh, I went with Carl. We actually were supposed to go fishing. We ended up looking for trees. It was right. kind of a challenge to make that <laughs> interesting. Uh, but typically, we don't. You know, if they're a race car driver, um, you know, we don't uh, we don't talk about race car driving. We, uh, uh, you know, we just talk about hunting. Uh, Gary Anderson, for example, was the the National Football League's um, leading scorer at one time. He was a field goal kicker. Um, he actually came from South Africa to the USA and then and then took residence here. Uh, we went we went fishing together, and he was an outstanding fly fisherman. Uh, so you know it was fun. We actually went to Alaska. For, we spent a week in a remote camp. So you know, that was to really get to know him, and uh, it really was a great experience. So Joseph, before we we wrap up this interview, I, I always get in trouble if I forget to ask this. What is your sure. best hunting story? Best hunting story. Mm. Well, you know, it's hard to – there are stories, you know, it's hard to rank them out. But let me just tell one that – actually, a fellow called me on Facebook the other day or, or contacted me on Facebook. And I recognized his name, and I said – I got back to him. I said, were you the 
are you the brother of a fellow that I hunted with in, in South Carolina? But the, the deal was uh, South Carolina has so many deer uh, that you can shoot unlimited bucks there. Right. And uh, the season comes in the middle of August, which is the first one in the United States. So I, I went down to uh, to this place, and the, the fellow says, uh, we have a tree stand we think would be good. It overlooks a bean field. So he gave me directions. I drove up, parked my truck, walked into the stand, climbed up in it. It's about uh, 15 feet off the ground, just a small platform with a seat. And I tucked my camera. I always have cameras with me. I was under the seat. Well, I was there about an hour, and a big thunderstorm rolled in. And, of course, you're sitting in a tree um, during a thunderstorm, and, you know, the, the, the it just rained like crazy for 10 or 15 minutes, and, and then it stopped, and the clouds moved away. I thought, okay, well, this is good. This is probably about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, about 5 o'clock, here comes another storm. And of course, you hear the, the thunder and lightning rolling and uh, clouds. It gets dark. I mean, it's almost night. Uh Excuse me. Again, it, it rolls through, and I thought, wow, okay, I survived that one. Of course, the lightning's <laughs> cracking all around, and you're in the tree. Well, it finally gets to be just just about dark, and I can look up and tell. I can see the lightning and, and hear the hear the thunder and the winds blowing, and 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 a, a lightning bolt just burst across the sky and just lit the whole field. And I said, you know what? I need to get out of here. <laughs> and, and, and and as I as I reached down to grab my camera. I looked down to my left, and I could see a white-tailed uh, buck standing about 20 yards from the stand behind me. Now, where he was, I could only see him when the lightning would strike. But uh, <laughs> luckily, he walked out into the into the field where I could see, and I shot him. So I climbed down, walked over to him, uh, went out, and I uh, got my truck and drove it in. That Earlier in this hunt, I had uh, done something to my back. Okay, and I tried and tried to get the deer into the back of the truck. There was just no way that was going to happen. It weighed about, I guess, 150 pounds. So it, you know, it was quite a bit to pick up. And I thought, How, what, what can I do? Well, I walked out to the highway. And when I got to the highway, there was a car park at right the entrance to this, this little farm. And, and I looked in the window. It was pouring at this time. I looked in the window, and I see a person wearing blaze orange which is required to, to wear in, in the USA during the rifle season. So I knocked on the window, and the guy rolled down the window. I said, can you help me? Uh, I have a deer down, and I can't get it I can't get it loaded. And he said, you got a deer? Wow, good. Yeah, I'll gladly come and help. So he and his son, he and his son walked back this road. We loaded the deer, and then, you know, I got out of there. But, I mean, number one, what was the chance? What were their probability of sitting through three thunderstorms <laughs> and what even to get uh, to get a really nice buck? And then to have the good fortune to walk out to a highway and have a hunter right at that spot. I mean, this is an old back road that had very little traffic. So, you know, I could have been there most of the evening and not had a car go by. So anyway, that was a that's kind of a great story. Hey, Joseph, if we want, we obviously can go to Amazon to get your book. You've also got a website. Can you tell us what that is? It's huntingwithjoebuyers.com. Uh, it's it, it just like it says, hunting with J-O-E-B-Y-E-R-S dot com. That's my website, but I, I use that primarily as a reference because I book hunts for people. I usually take people to Africa with me when I go. Again, I'd encourage your uh, your listeners to uh, check out griffinsguide dot com or or on Facebook if you go to Facebook forward slash the hunting page, the hunting page, all one word. You, you'll see. Uh, the, the two sites work together. What I'll Just do is I'll put all of those links in the uh, in the comments section of this podcast so our listeners can find them nice and easy. Okay, Stephen. Thank you very much. Hey, Joseph, you've been a great interview. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Take care. Just a quick reminder, if you're active on our Facebook page, on the forums, or even send us an email, just go to www.thehuntingshow.co.nz and you could win some of those great prizes from Gerber by being one of our fans of the month. That's us. Good hunting. Broadcasting from an undisclosed location, from a secret hunting spot known only to him and the guy who told him about it and possibly the guy who told the guy who told him. It's a show all about hunting in New Zealand and around the globe. This is The Hunting Show. Find The Hunting Show on Facebook and Twitter for up-to-date information.